50 million Americans who are in pain today were also in pain yesterday, and the day before, and the day before that, and actually most days, if not every day, for more than six months. They're America's chronic pain patients. If you extrapolate that number to the worldwide population, that suggests there may be a billion people globally who are in a similar predicament. Of those 50 million Americans, 40% suffer from high-impact pain. That seriously disrupts their lives. Not surprisingly, most of them are depressed. The majority of them don't sleep properly, and sleep disruption has its own problems. And a small minority of them are helped by analgesic drugs like the opiates, the most powerful drugs we have for that, but drugs that have their own problems. A lot of work's gone into trying to figure out the economic burden that all this carries. In North America alone, it's estimated to be north of half a trillion US dollars a year. But that doesn't capture the personal cost of all this, either at the society level or the level of the individual. Some of you may know about this from friends and family. But nothing really makes it tolerable. So what we have to do is to try to treat the intractable. But how can you possibly do that? What makes chronic, patient, chronic pain patients so unhappy is not just the pain itself. It's also the constant fear of impending pain. So if you get a gap when some, something isn't actually hurting, it's not a time of carefree release. It's a time of waiting anxiously for what may happen next. How bad will it be, and when will it happen? So perhaps that aspect of chronic pain offers us a target that we might try to treat to make their lives more tolerable. So the first experiment I'm going to talk about is something that my colleagues and I did to try and separate the anticipation of pain from the experience of it. That sounds easy, and logically it is, but practically it may not be. Because it's possible that a signal that you're about to experience pain just activates all the same circuits that pain itself activates. And if we can't deal with that activity when the circuits are activated by pain, why should we think we can do it any better when they're activated by fear of pain? So the key question is going to be, is there just one circuit that does both these things, in which case we don't have a new target, or might there be two? And this is how we do it. On the back of your hand, I put a little heating device. And I can control what it does. I can warm it up so it's a pleasant glow on the back of your hand, or I can heat it up so it really hurts. And then I'm going to stick you into a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, which is a bit like being slid backwards headfirst into a drain pipe where you're stuck. And then I'm going to start hurting you, and I want to see what happens in your brain. This is what you might see. A green light comes on, and the back of your hand is warmed. OK, the experiment's not so bad. But then a blue light might come on, and the back of your hand is really painfully heated. That hurts. A red light comes on. What's, what's going to happen now? Nothing. What I want to know is whether the brain's response to those lights changes with learning. Does the expectation of pain and the experience of pain end up simply activating the same bits of brain? Or, and this is my key question, does anticipation not just activate the pain system early, but does it do something different? That tells me whether I might have a new target to treat. Now, all these sorts of experiments are subtraction experiments. What you do is a bit of logic. If you want to know about which bits of brain respond to pain, you subtract the brain activation when the back of your hand is warm from the brain activation when it's painfully hot. If you want to know about the signal, you subtract the response to the signal saying it's not going to be very hot from the signal saying it is going to be very hot. That's the anticipation of pain. If those two subtractions just reveal the same circuits, I don't have two targets. But here's what actually happened. The yellow is the bits of brain that were activated by the signal. The red, the bits of brain activated by the pain. Down at the bottom, you see gray bars. 
Look to the right. Those four gray bars are the first four times that we actually burned the back of the hand. At each time, there's a big response in the brain. Now look to the left. Those four bars are the first time you saw the light that, went, that predicted the pain. The first time that happens, you don't know what it predicts, and you don't respond. But the second, third, and fourth times you've learned, and there's the response. Here's the second place. Again, bottom right, the pain always hurts. Bottom left, you learn what the signal means, and you learn to respond. And here's the third. Again, four episodes of pain, all getting a clear response, and a slow build-up on the left as you learn what the signal means. So that says there are different targets, and that might offer us routes for potential therapies. But my second question is whether these circuits interact, and can we separately manipulate them, and does it matter when we do? Now, those of you who don't like images of things that hurt should shut your eyes briefly, because this didn't hurt, but it does look nasty. The guy who rather carelessly stuck this through his toe suffered from diabetes and felt no pain. But this guy did feel pain. He stood on a nail which went straight through the sole of his boot and out through the top, and he was taken to the casualty feeling pretty sorry for himself and very miserable. What do you do when this happens? Well, actually, you carefully cut the boot off so you can see exactly how most safely to remove the nail. And when that happened, it turned out the nail had gone neatly between two toes, and he walked home feeling a lot better. Now, why did it hurt? So the second experiment asks whether we can enhance the pain associated with a reasonable temperature by making you anxious about what might happen. Physiologically, obviously, I can turn up pain by just turning the dial. But now we're going psychologically. If I increase your pain-related anxiety and uncertainty, if you think the pain you might be about to experience could be really bad, will it hurt more? And can I model the experience of a man with a nail through his boot and not his foot? Same sort of design. I put you in the magnet, here comes the green light, and it's a low temperature, and things are looking up. I put you in, you get the blue light, also low temperature. That's not so bad at all. But now, just twice in the experiment, a green light will be followed by a really rather intense pain. Now what I want to know is, does that green signal after that experience now make you more anxious than the blue signal does? And does the low temperature that you get following the green signal now feel more painful than the same temperature following the blue signal? Is this effectively like turning up the heat if it is more painful, or is there another circuit? We know it works. The top left shows that that green signal made people more anxious than the blue one. And it's not just self-report. The top right shows that the heart rate differentiates between the two things as well. But what really matters is down there at the bottom. On the right, you can see that high temperatures really hurt. No surprise there. And on the left, you can see that low temperatures don't particularly. No surprise there either. But what really matters is the one in the middle, where it's the same low temperature, but when you're more anxious. And people then say, that hurts more. That's a statistically significant outcome. So being anxious about what may happen does make it worse. Another subtraction experiment. If I want to know the heat intensity effects on pain, then I subtract the low temperature when you're anxious from the high temperature when you're anxious. The difference there is simply the existence of the heat. But if I want to know about the anxiety intensity effects on pain, I subtract the low temperature when you weren't particularly anxious from the low temperature when you were. And that's where the anxiety about pain might be exacerbating it. The top panel shows you the pattern when we just turn up the dial. The whole of the pain system lights up, as you might expect it would. But the bottom one shows just one point in the brain that's activated, whose activity predicts the increase in pain caused by the increase in anxiety. So, the look as though there were, are separate circuits, and that implies potentially separate targets. 
But this tells you something else that I think is interesting, which is that there's a limit on your capacity to figure out internally what's happened to you. If you were in that magnet, you wouldn't necessarily know whether it hurt more because I just tweaked the dial a bit without telling you, or whether it hurt more because I'd made you anxious. But I could tell by looking at your brain scan. So, the psychology of this is that if we increase your fear about the pain that you might get, then it makes it hurt more. I haven't shown you other experiments we've carried out in which we've shown that we can give you safety signals that make you less anxious about what may happen next, which reduce anxiety. And maybe those would be a way, actually, to help alleviate the pain as well as alleviating the anxiety. And there is, 10 days ago, a fascinating clinical report of a woman with a very rare mutation who experiences neither pain nor anxiety and depression. We know a certain amount about the biochemical consequences of her mutation, and maybe that offers a way we could design a drug that will treat the whole syndrome all at once. But that's for the future. Right now, for the last bit of the talk, I just want to talk about directly manipulating the brain to see if we can treat a particularly intractable form of chronic pain. If you lose a limb, there's about a 90% chance that you'll be left with a strange feeling as though the missing limb is still there. It's called a phantom limb. You know very well it isn't there, but it can feel as though it is. And if you have phantom limb sensation, about 65% of you will also have pain in that phantom limb. Now, it's very, very hard to treat this highly resistant to analgesics, and there are some very interesting and exotic treatments that have been tried, which you can look up for yourselves if you want, using a mirror, for example, to, to make it look as if your missing limb is really there and you can move it. But we're going to talk about where the phantom is, how the phantom happens, and what we can do about it. So, the whole of your body is represented somewhere in your brain, and there's a sort of sch schematic of how that works. So your hand, which is a very important part of you, has a big area devoted to it. And our question is, what happens to that hand area when it doesn't get its input from the hand anymore and it can't send outputs to the hand anymore either? What goes on? Well, we know that the brain adapts to amputation. If you lose a hand early, you learn all sorts of ways very efficiently to operate without it. These two people have both been asked to take the top off a drinking water bottle, and the one who lost his hand early uses his residual arm to hang on to the bottle, and he uses his intact hand just as you would. You'd use your left hand to hold the bottle and your right hand to take the top off. The one on the right, who lost his hand more recently, doesn't do that at all. He uses his right hand to pick up and hold the bottle, holds the top in his teeth, twists it. When it's loose, he takes the top off with his existing hand. And that sort of pattern turns out to be fairly general. Overall, if you lose your hand early, you don't use your remaining hand so much as if you've lost your hand late. So you learn to use what's left of the arm. That doesn't happen with the people who've lost hands early. That has consequences for the brain. So if we look at the area that used to represent the missing hand, we find that in people who lost the hand early, the residual arm now acts to some extent as though it were the hand. It activates the same bit of brain. Whereas for someone who lost their hand late, the remaining hand takes over the missing hand area as well. Now I've told you that phantom pain sufferers have these persisting representations of their missing limb. And what you see here is that if you're a two-handed person like me who's right-handed, if I move my left hand, the brain activation that that produces is actually no greater than for someone who's lost a hand imagining moving their phantom. So their phantom hand is as real to their brain as my left hand is to me. Now, if your missing hand is being controlled by a phantom that doesn't really exist, then what's going on there is quite unrelated to what's happening in the world around you. And so one consequence of this is that the normal coordination between the left and the right half of the brain isn't there, because part of the brain's just being controlled by something unrelated to what's going on. 
And it turns out that the less coordinated the two hemispheres are, the more likely you are to suffer phantom pain. So we're going to try and work with that. It's possible to stimulate the brain in a very non-invasive way by just passing a mild electrical current across it, about five volts, a small battery. And you can do that. It's hard even to notice it's being done to you. It's painless, pretty well undetectable. And here's someone having this done in the pain lab in Oxford. You simply pass a little current so that you are changing the excitability of the bit of brain directly under your electrode. Now, what does that do for possible phantom pain sufferers? Could this sort of stimulation help to reconfigure the area that's lost its normal input? If you start making phantom hand movements, they very often actually feel painful. But if, when you ask someone to start making phantom hand movements, you start stimulating across the missing hand area of the brain, then that pain doesn't occur. And this is the key result from an experiment that's just been published by the Oxford Pain Group and their collaborators. The gray bar that you see at the top left is the increase in pain that someone reports when they start making phantom hand movements and they're being given dummy stimulation of the kind I've just described. Beside it, that straight line, is someone also making phantom hand movements, but they are unknown to them getting the brain stimulation. So there's no increase in pain. That's one thing. The next pair show that at the end of that session, the people who've been making the phantom movements are in pain, not terrible, but in pain, and the ones who've been getting the stimulation actually now have a reduction in their overall pain. It just hasn't just stopped the phantom movements from increasing pain, it's reduced the background level of pain. And the most important thing is, out to the extreme right, six days later, the people who just made phantom movements are back to how they were, but the people who'd made phantom movements and had the brain stimulation, the transcranial direct current stimulation, they are still in less pain than they were to start with. So, What's the story here? The story is that if you combine psychology, that's behavioral and cognitive, and physiology, and you understand the circuits, then you can come up with a principled way to try to tackle these things. And neuroscience has shown us a way in which we can actually treat the intractable. There's hope. Thank you all very much. <laughs>